The President of France says that NATO is brain dead and that terrorism is now the enemy and not Russia. Emmanuel Macron wants his criticism to be a wake-up call for the military alliance. So, what does it mean for NATO's future? An organization the US President also once described as obsolete. This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Adrian Finnegan. After World War II and facing a rising threat from the Soviet Union, a group of European and North American countries banded together and signed up to the North Atlantic Treaty. They believed a collective defence was the best way to ensure future peace. In the years that followed, the organization's membership and goals expanded. There are now 29 countries committed to protecting the security of NATO's members. But on the Alliance's 70th anniversary, some are questioning its effectiveness. Just weeks after calling NATO brain dead, France's president, Emmanuel Macron, met the organization's boss for talks in Paris. Al Jazeera's Natasha Butler reports from the French capital. It was a longer handshake than usual for the French president. It seemed to be a sign that Emmanuel Macron was in a conciliatory mood as he greeted NATO Secretary General at the Elysee only a few weeks after he described the military alliance as brain dead. But if Jens Stoltenberg had hoped for an apology or a retraction, he didn't get one, as Macron stood by his claim that NATO lacked direction. The questions I ask are open questions that we have not resolved. Peace in Europe, past the INF Treaty, the relationship with Russia, the subject with Turkey. Who is the enemy? So until we resolve these issues, let's not negotiate cost sharing or burden sharing. Maybe we needed a wake-up call, if you permit the English expression. Stoltenberg said NATO members often had different opinions, but that didn't mean the alliance had no future. So the paradox is that while questions are being asked about the strength of the transatlantic bond, North America and Europe are doing more together than we have done for decades. It's clear that Macron's comment that NATO is brain dead didn't go down well with Stoltenberg, but it's certainly shaken up the alliance and focused minds on coming up with some new ideas. Germany's foreign minister has suggested that a group of experts from outside NATO could be created to review the organization. Some analysts say such a move would be constructive. There was war in Ukraine, there's a huge problem in the uh, Middle East, a war in Syria, uh, Iraq, uh, Iran is uh, behaving differently. So this is something very useful and it's much better to discuss the problem together with experts inside the alliance than, than criticizing the alliance and uh, uh, jeopardizing the, 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 the credibility of the alliance. Next week, NATO leaders meet in London for a special summit to mark its creation 70 years ago during the Cold War. It was a time when members agreed on their aims and who was the enemy. Today, its leaders are politically polarized and the security challenges have changed. NATO might not be at death's door yet, but most members and experts concede that for it to survive successfully, it needs a fresh approach. Natasha Butler, Al Jazeera, Paris. Meanwhile, France and fellow member Turkey are locked in a war of words ahead of next week's NATO summit. Emmanuel Macron says that Ankara put NATO's mission at risk with its recent military operation in northern Syria. But Turkey's president says that Macron doesn't understand the situation. I respect the security interests of our Turkish ally, who has suffered many terrorist attacks on its soil, but one cannot on one hand say that we are allies and with respect to this demand our solidarity, and on the other hand put its allies in the face of a military offensive done as a fait accompli, which endangers the action of the coalition against Islamic State, which NATO is a part of. Proclaiming commitment to collective security is not enough, you must show it. A real alliance is about actions and decisions, not words. So I wish to have a real discussion between allies on our concrete engagements in the fight against terrorism in the Sahel, as in the Levant region. The military intervention carried out by Turkey in northeast Syria has brought up real questions which must be tackled. All right, let's bring in our guests for today's discussion. Joining us now from Paris, John Lockland international law consultant and professor at the University Institute of St. Pius, via Skype from Santander, Fabrice Potier, 
uh, Chief Strategy Officer at Rasmussen Global and former Director of Policy Planning at NATO. And from Ankara, we're joined by Yusuf Alabada, security analyst and retired Turkish colonel. Gentlemen, uh, welcome to you all. John, let's start with you. Did NATO need a wake-up call? Is Macron right when he says that the organisation is brain dead? Yes, he's absolutely right. And uh, he returned to the theme because the brain dead remark was made uh, 10 days or two weeks ago. And he returned to the theme only, only recently uh, and said that uh, he, had, he was very pleased to have raised this issue and to put it on the table. And he asked the question, which really is the ultimate question. And it's an ultimate question because in NATO doesn't have the answer. The question is, who's the enemy? Macron said, who's the enemy? Is it Russia? Is it peace in Europe? Uh, is it Turkey? Uh, who is the enemy? And because NATO is unable to answer that question, uh, it is like a, a bad uh, scene from a, a theatre of the absurd. It's six characters or 29 characters in search of an author. They're people who've lost the plot. Uh, they need a new plot. They want a plot because they want to justify their existence. But they don't have one. A military alliance only makes sense if you know who you are allied against, and NATO doesn't. Fabrice. Turkey's enemy oh. is the Kurds. Poland's enemy is Russia. And uh, the United States and uh, Europe have, have different views on who is the enemy. Uh, Fabrice uh, Poitier uh, in uh, Santander, does NATO have a future? Can Europe forge ahead on its own in terms of uh, security without the US and Turkey? Well, let me first uh, strongly disagree with Jonathan. I guess we're in a debate, so uh, for the sake of it. Uh, I think NATO does have clarity about what, does it, what are the biggest threats <clears throat> that the alliance is facing. And if you just look at the past few years, you know, which power has invited uh, a European country like Ukraine? Which power has placed new type of missiles right at the heart of Europe, threatening European capitals? Which power has conducted flights and military maneuvers that are against international norms and rules? That's Russia. So in that sense, I think NATO is very clear on where the threat comes from. And it has actually never denied, at least when I was at, at NATO, that the Middle East, meaning terrorism and failed states, pose a real threat. But the reality is actually France, among some countries, has always blocked NATO playing a more active, both political, but also operational role in the Middle East. So I think uh, Macron is right. It's always healthy to have a wake up call. But I think we also have to look at our own contradictions. And I think here France has many contradictions when it comes to its traditional positioning at NATO. Uh, John, I, I know you want to come back on that. I, I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let you do so in just a moment. But let's bring in uh, Yusuf, first of all, from uh, Ankara. Uh, Yusuf, is, is Turkey still committed to NATO or is it drifting away from the alliance and the West? I mean, what sort of an alliance partner is it when it undertakes strategic decisions without consulting its allies and buys uh, Russian surface-to-air missiles? OK, uh, to tell the truth, uh, we can define after the Cold War, the threat is very easily. In the new security understanding, the new threat is terrorism, the new threat is the migration flow and refugees, the new threat is the Russian aggression, humanitarian disasters, and also the failed states, especially in the Middle East. And when you take a look at the Turkey's position, it is very clear that Turkey is fighting with all kinds of terrorism inside the Middle East, on the ground, which fought against Daesh and neutralized more than 3,000 members of the Daesh and also always sharing information about the terrorist activities inside the Middle East. And we know very well that, including French, they do not even accept their citizens who fought in the name of Daesh inside Middle East. And Mr. Trump has underlined for many times that European countries, including France, should take the responsibility and should accept their citizens back to their country and put them on trial. So, for this reason, against fighting against terrorism, Turkey is committing what he has promised so far with a clear numbers that we can observe. The other issue is that migration and the refugee crisis is one of the most important issues that we should act together with the NATO. And let me remind you that Turkey is hosting almost 4 million Syrians inside this country, 
and more than 1.5 million refugees who migrated to Turkey from another parts of the world, including Africa, including Afghanistan and Pakistan. And Turkey officially signed the readmission agreement with the European Union. So no one can blame Turkey in order to not cooperate against the refugees because the numbers that I am providing is very clear to everyone. Okay. The other issue is that the Russian aggression. Russian aggression, it is very okay. important. I should talk about this. The Russian aggression is also very important. Turkey clearly supports the Ukraine government against Russia and also clearly stated that Turkey is against all kind of occupation inside Crimea, officially declared it to Russia and to the Ukraine. For this reason, by knowing those facts that we cannot put Turkey to another side while we are not even accepting one refugee and we are not putting our own citizens who fought in name of Daesh and put them on trial. For uh, this reason, let's consider with the realities. Okay. Y Yusuf, I, I, I want to give John a, a say, which I will do in just a moment. Just You talk about Russian aggression. Why then did Turkey buy uh, this Russian surface-to-air missile system? Very, very nice question, very nice question. Turkey has already requested from the United States in order to buy Patriot missile system because Turkey has a soft spot of air defense uh, systems. But including United States and the European Union countries, none of them provided to sell Turkey air defense missile system. And Mr. Trump in the Japan at the meeting clearly stated that Turkey requested to buy the, the Patriot missile system, but we didn't provide, so they want uh, they went and bought the S-400 systems in order to uh, in order to close the gap in the air defense system. And Turkey clearly says to the French and Italy also, okay. they are ready to cooperate to produce and right. to buy the French and uh, American missile systems if they provide it to Turkey. All right, John, um, I see you shaking your head a lot there. Should NATO be helping Turkey in its fight <laughs> against what it sees as terrorists in northern Syria, but the others within NATO regard as allies? I mean, how does NATO square that circle? Well, uh, Turkey has never asked for NATO's help uh, in Syria, but I think the answer you've just heard uh, makes it absolutely clear that Turkey does not regard Russia as an enemy. It's not conceivable to buy air defence systems from someone whom you regard as an enemy. Turkey may condemn uh, what it calls, in my view, wrongly, Rus Russian aggression in Ukraine, uh, but the facts of diplomacy are that uh, Turkey and Russia work together on a number of issues, including as it happens in Syria. So it's just not true to say that Russia is an enemy of Turkey. It's not true, uh, uh, Fabrice Potier, to say that uh, Russia is considered an enemy by France. President Macron received President Putin at the Fort de Brégançon uh, in August, just before the G7 summit. And he said, I'm sorry, I didn't interrupt you. Could you let me finish? And he said that he wanted to build, together with Russia, a, a, an architecture of confidence in order to improve European security and to solve other world crises. That's not the language that you use when you're addressing an enemy. You don't build an architecture of confidence with your enemy. So things have moved on since whatever NATO communique you're referring to. Uh, and by the way, on the 9th of December, there's going to be a Normandy format meeting between France, Germany, Ukraine and Russia, in which they're going to try and sort out the Ukraine. Again, that's not the language that you use with an enemy. So all this talk about Russian aggression and Russia being the enemy does not correspond to the political realities that have un unfolded in recent weeks. And if you try to pretend otherwise, then nobody is going to believe you. Fabrice, come back on that. Well, I think it, lots of uh, quite controversial things I've just heard. First, I've not used the word enemy because I think it, it characterizes an actor and, and put kind of absolute tag on it. I'm talking about the behavior and that's why I talked about threat. And the threats of the past years clearly come from uh, a nuclear power called Russia that is actually flexing its muscle in its neighborhood and putting pressure, including on uh, NATO allies. So I, I, I've never said that Paris considers Russia as an enemy. I just say that NATO, of which France is a member, has clearly stated over the past uh, five years plus, 
that the biggest threat facing Europe today and the alliance is Russia's behavior that is highly disruptive and basically land grabbing behavior, which I guess we can all agree is not acceptable. That's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, I think to, to talk about uh, the, the Normandy format as a proof that Russia is the friend of Europe is, is a bit far, far fetched. That Normandy format meeting is an important one. It's the first one in three years. Finally, there is a leaders dialogue on how to solve the conflict in Donbass, which has killed 13,000 Ukrainians over the past uh, five years. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's going to be solved anytime soon. This is a very complicated situation. And Russia is not showing any sign of withdrawing its military personnel in eastern Ukraine or withdrawing its heavy weaponry. Uh, so I think it's a bit, a bit quick conclusion to say that now we are good and Russia is, is back in the fold of those who have normal, acceptable, legal behavior. OK, and, and, and on the question of whether NATO should be in the business of fighting terrorism, Fabrice, as, as President Macron has, has appeared to indicate I, I, that he wants. Yeah, absolutely. I think I was one of those pushing for NATO to play a more active role in the broader Middle East and North Africa for the simple reason that this is our neighborhood and this is now since the Arab Spring a very fragmented and a very unstable neighborhood and you cannot just ignore it but I can tell you that clearly uh, many people agree with that but France among few others think that NATO or at least was thinking until President Macron made this statement that NATO does not have a role in the wider Middle East and North Africa. However, here there is a key question, and this is really for the leaders to discuss next week in London. What do they call terrorism? Because what you hear from Erdogan when he talks about terrorism is a slightly different type of terrorism uh, and type of actors when the French president talks about. So I think this is where leaders meeting is really important, is to say, what do we think is real, the, the, the threat behind that terrorism, because if not, it's a too broad category and everybody will give different definition and we never agree on what to do exactly. OK, y Yusuf, um, Turkey's foreign minister this week called President Macron a sponsor of terrorism after uh, the French president held talks in Paris with uh, the FDA, uh, SDF spokesperson. Uh, right now, there's a void in Europe. He said Macron is trying to be its leader, but leadership comes naturally. I mean, what's Turkey's problem with France? OK. Uh... In the visit to the United States, the Turkish president already uh, presented some CIA documents that the SDF spokesperson and the terrorist Muslim Kobani's CIA records that he has committed many terror attacks inside Turkey, not from the perspective of Turkey, but from the perspective and the records of the CIA. For this reason, accepting those guys inside the Shanzeliza Palace cannot be acceptable. Turkey always extended its condolences with the prime minister level when the Charlie Hebdo attack has been occurred. And the prime minister Davutoglu was on the streets of Champs-Élysées to extend the condolences of the Turkey. So we should be very clear that if terror is a very bad thing for us, we should understand that it is also bad for the France. From this perspective, if we do not provide a comprehensive approach fighting against terrorism, we will never be able to fight against terrorism. My counterpart, a little bit ago, said that Turkey is not collaborating with NATO and with the European Union countries, especially fight against terrorism inside Syria. That is totally not correct. Because I am giving the numbers. Turkey fought against Daesh and lost more than 100 its soldiers and neutralized 3,000 Daesh members. And you still tell me that Turkey is not collaborating with the France. Let me tell. And I would like to remind also the headquarter of the anti daesh coalition is inside Turkey and Turkey is providing huge support to the anti daesh coalition. Okay. Let me also remind that my friend, my friend John in Paris is getting a very nice sleep because of the Turkish radar system monitoring inside Russia 24 hours in a day. So we should understand that Turkey is together with the NATO Okay. Keeping all its responsibilities, uh, so so we should right. we should understand the problem from this perspective. J John, uh, uh, respond to that briefly, if you if you will, and then answer this for me. The U.S. and Turkey aren't exactly the easiest of NATO's members to deal with. 
politically at least. Uh, to what extent is, is President Macron now making France another awkward ally? Uh, I mean, what, 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 is, what exactly does he want? Well, uh, that's, that, uh, that's how I started off the discussion. He wants clarity. He wants uh, political clarity uh, about what, what NATO is trying to do. That's why I used the word enemy. Uh, the, the reason why I used it is that President Macron said, who is the enemy? The, the whole problem with NATO, and we, we've just heard from uh, Yusuf this huge list of things that NATO is supposed to do. It's supposed to help with the refugee crisis. It's supposed to help with terrorism. It's supposed to help with Ukraine. It's supposed to help with Syria, Russia, goodness knows what else, failed states. That's not how military alliances work. That's not what NATO was created to do. NATO had one function when it was created, and that was to protect Western Europe from Soviet threat. Now, if we're saying it's got five or six or ten different functions, uh, including uh, fighting things that we don't even agree uh, on the definition of, like terrorism, then that means it does not know what it is doing. And it clearly does not know what it is doing. Because, I'm sorry, the Kurds were the allies of France and other Western European countries, and they are the enemies of Turkey. And in that situation, you cannot have a military alliance where one person's friend is another person's enemy. It's uh, just the iron rule of politics. Uh, Fabrice, Turkey signalled that at the summit next week uh, it's going to block formal approval of uh, this military plan to defend Poland, Lithuania, uh, Estonia and Latvia in the event of, of a Russian attack. Given all that we've just heard, what are the prospects for this, this 70th anniversary meeting in London? Are, are members going to knuckle down and turn their attention to what NATO is actually for? Or is it going to descend into acrimony? Well, I, I, I hope they're going to have a very frank and hopefully deep discussion about what exactly uh, they want the alliance to do. But I think from what Jonathan said earlier, one should not forget the alliance is just the sum of its members. And I think the clarity <clears throat> that uh, Macron is seeking is not the clarity coming from NATO, is the clarity coming from France, from Turkey, from the United States, and even from Germany in terms of defense spending and investment. So I think the conversation is not about NATO, the institution. It's actually pretty, pretty healthy and it's been doing quite impressive things over the last five years in terms of transformation. The real problem is at the political level with the key members, which we just talked about. So I think in, in London, what I can hope for is for once, leaders are going to put the speaking points aside. They're going to put the nice consensus language of communique aside, and they're going to really try to figure out what exactly do we are we willing to commit to? And I do think it's not a black and white choice. It's not about either Russia or terrorists. I think it can be both. And it has to be both because NATO is not about just one threat. NATO is about assuring okay. the collective security of all its members. Y Yusuf, I have about a minute left on the programme here. I mean, how do you see next week's meeting go? Do you see uh, Turkey remaining part of this NATO alliance in the long term? Yes, of course. I am telling you that the new security challenges and the new security challenges which Europe is facing can be fought only with the help and with the assistance of the Turkey. And also, last uh, word uh, to John, Turkey is not the enemy of the Kurds and Kurds are not the enemy of the Turkish people. Let me remind you that Turkey is hosting more than oh, 350,000 really? Kurdish people from the Syria and you have no idea what's going on inside the field. For this reason, you cannot label Turkey as the enemy of the Kurdish people. During 1991, in the Halepçe, when Saddam Hussein used chemical people. weapons also, Turkey, you said Kurds. So, uh, please do not interrupt me. I didn't interrupt you. So, labeling Turkey as the enemy of the Kurds is not correct, because in Turkey, there are more than 10 million Kurdish people living. And let me say that today, the Kurdistan regional government yes, of yes, Iraq, yes. foreign minister of affairs, was in Turkey. And he clearly states that the YPG and PKK okay. is the common enemy of the Kurds right. and Turks in this land. Uh, gentlemen, we are out of time, uh, I'm afraid. Many thanks indeed for being with us today. John Lachlan, uh, Fabrice Potier and uh, Yusuf Alabada. Uh, thank you, as always, for watching. Don't forget you can see this program anytime just by going to the website, altazero.com. For further discussion, though, join us at our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle at AJ Inside Story. From me, Adrian Finnegan, 
and the whole team here in Doha. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again. Bye for now.